It, the meeting is on Facing the Anthropocene, Fossil Capitalism and the Crisis of the Earth System. This is the title of, um, of the book, and obviously the speaker is the author, Ian Angus. Um, I, Ian is a, a Canadian activist who's also editor of the online journal uh, Climate and Capitalism, and uh, also the editor of a brand new book, uh, A Redder Shade of Green, which is actually being launched this weekend and uh, will be on sale uh, with, uh, with this book as well after the meeting. So um, Ian will be speaking for about 30, 35 minutes and there will be plenty of time for questions, contributions. And so I'm going to hand over to Ian now. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and many thanks to the Socialist Workers' Party for inviting me to... Uh, England, and more particularly London. I love visiting London. There's so many things you can do here that you really can't do anywhere else. This, for example, is me sitting in a cafe two days ago um, with a very small glass of orange juice and a cup of really terrible coffee that <laughs> together cost 10 pounds. Um, um, now, you can say you can have, you know, expensive bad food almost anywhere in the world, and that's true. But in London, if you know the address here, this is 30 Dean Street. Um, so I was in the restaurant. 30 Dean Street is where Karl Marx, Jenny Marx, Helen DeMuth, uh, three children and a number that, or several that were stillborn, uh, lived from 19, 1851 to uh, 1856. And the little plaque is almost invisible up there. Um, they lived in abject poverty in three small rooms here. And at that time, there wouldn't even have been running water, let alone expensive coffee. Um, they would have to go out to a well. And during the time that they were there, about four or five city blocks away, um, they, one of the wells got polluted during the time they lived there and caused a cholera outbreak, um, which killed hundreds of working class people and if that had been if they had lived just a block or two over it likely would have been the well they used and uh, we and the the they and the world are extraordinarily lucky that that didn't happen in any event i think there's a sort of remarkably uh, wonderful irony about capitalism to drink a uh, 5 pound cup of coffee in that place um <laughs> My book, Facing the Anthropocene, oh, the pronunciation. It, my experience is it's Anthropocene if you're British and Anthropocene if you're American. And I'm a Canadian, so I alternate. <laughs> <coughs> and you will hear me using both. I just, I can't avoid it. Um, the book was published just over a year ago in, in May of 2016. The timing of the book was remarkably success, uh, fortunate because at the time I started writing it, almost nobody had heard that word. And anybody I mentioned it to would just stare at me. Some of them still do. Um, and, but at the end of August, just a couple of months after the book came out, the uh, International Working Group on the Anthropocene, the geologist, geology group that's working on it, um, formally concluded and, and uh, told the World Geological Congress um, that the Anthropocene was in fact real and should be recognized as a former, formal geological epoch. They are now, in fact, working on the process of, there's a whole lot of final details you've got to do in geology in order to convince other geologists. But the people who know most about this have reached that conclusion now. The result was there was suddenly a lot of coverage in the media and I got a lot of interviews out of it. Um, I must say that judging by the questions I was asked, and judging even more by the articles that got written, um, it's still not really very well uh, recognized or understood by journalists. Um, now, I can't po promise to make it crystal clear in this talk, but I will try to. And my focus is going to be on material that's basically covered in the first couple of chapters, first three, four chapters of the book, um, about what the Anthropocene is and why it matters to us as to the world and to us as socialists. A commitment to science has been central to Marxism from the very beginning. Marx and Engels devoted an enormous amount of their time to studying uh, evolution, soil science, geology, physics, mathematics, and much more. 
They did it because their socialism was not an abstraction. It wasn't a set of good wishes for the world, but deeply rooted in the real world, not dreamed up out of nothing. For them, science was inseparable from politics and from economics and from class struggle. When he was writing his masterpiece, Capital, in the 1860s, Marx wrote to Engels that what he had learned from German agricultural chemistry was more important than all the economists put together. <laughs> Facing the Anthropocene, my book, starts with that fundamental Marxist view that we need to have a concrete materialist understanding of how our world works and how it's changing because if we don't have that, our views are going to be floating in midair with no concrete foundation. What I'm trying to do, and what I think the socialist movement worldwide needs to focus on more, is to bridge the gap between earth system science and eco-socialism, to show socialists why they need to understand the Anthropocene, and to show earth system scientists why they need to understand ecological Marxism. Now, I can't cover that whole subject in one talk, but I'll try to explain why I think it's important. Most people are really not aware that we are in the midst of a scientific revolution, a radical change in how, we, how scientists view the globe, the world we live on, a change that, whose impact has been justly compared to Coper Copernicus's discovery that the Earth goes around the sun, or to Darwin's theory of evolution. Scientists have long studied aspects of the Earth, using the methods of geology and biology, ecology, physics, and other disciplines. What we've seen in the past two decades, since about the middle of the 1990s, is the emergence of Earth System Science, capital letters. The study of the Earth not as separate components, but as an integrated global system. And one result of that process has been the arrival of a new word, Anthropocene. As I said earlier, most people uh, never heard of it until recently. The world seemed to come out of nowhere. Word. It first appeared in the scientific literature in 2000. The first use of the word at a scientific event was in February of 2000. And for about the next decade, it remained pretty much the exclusive property of specialists in the earth scientists. That has changed. According to a recent paper published by the Anthropocene Working Group, the term has now been used in more than 1,300 scientific papers, which collectively have been cited more than 12,000 times. It has given rise to at least four scientific journals and periodicals. When I started writing my book, I was figuring I was going to control the market because nobody else would want to write about this. But it is... <laughs> <laughs> the word appears in the title now of more than 100 books, and um, the Oxford English Dictionary has officially accepted it, which is a big deal if you know the Oxford English Dictionary at all. Um, it's, it's not just crazy guys sending little pieces of paper. They actually look at things. There's an obscure reference. It's the subject of innumerable newspaper and magazine articles, as well as websites, uh, videos, and blogs. There are exhibitions uh, about the architecture in the Anthropocene, um, conferences about the humanities in the Anthropocene. Um, I even recently read a blog post. And I, I had to take the author's word that he was serious, because the post was called Reading the Book of Mormon in the Anthropocene. But of course, we are uh, serious political people in this room, and um, we don't judge the success or importance of a concept by whether it's uh, been mentioned in newspapers or articles. For us, the important question is, has it been mentioned in a daily comic strip? <laughs> and by that significant measure, the Anthropocene breakthrough occurred in December of 2014 in the comic strip Dilbert, when... Bob the dinosaur asked his smartwatch what time it was, and the watch replied, this is the Anthropocene epoch. For completeness, this was the final panel. 
Um, you know, it, it's rare for a scientific term to move so quickly into wide acceptance. But, and I want to stress this point, the widespread acceptance and use of the term, as you can see by an article called Reading the Book of Mormon in the Anthropocene, has also been accompanied by a fairly substantial wave of misunderstanding and confusion. If you've read any of the articles or books or in academic papers, chances are that what you read got it wrong, certainly in the, daily, in, the, in the popular press, chances are that what you read got it wrong in some substantial way. Three common ways that we see it misrepresented or misunderstood. One common represent, misrepresentation treats Anthropocene as a trendy buzzword just for modern times. And a lot of discussion of it is just it's used as though that's all it means. Like the Roaring Twenties of the Jazz Age, we got the Anthropocene. So somebody who organizes a seminar on art in the Anthropocene or poetry in the Anthropocene may well have very valuable things to say about art or poetry, but it's extremely unlikely that they will address recent scientific research and the radical implications for the future of the Earth. Another common misconception not just in popular magazines, but in political commentaries and even in academic circles, uh, is that it refers to the time since human beings started in, uh, changing ecosystems. Now, the problem with using that as the term is changing ecosystems is what human beings have been doing ever since the genus Homo occurred. That is what our, our species is pretty much defined by the fact that we change ecosystems deliberately. Um, so if that was what the Anthropocene was, then it's nothing new because it's been around for two and a half million years or so. A third common one, misconception, is that the Anthropocene means that humans now control the natural world, that the non-human natural, non-human nature no longer exists. Well, human activity is changing the world, but humans are by no means in control. Quite the contrary, what we see and this is important in this, what we see is not management and control of nature, but chaos and unintended consequences. More storms, more floods, more droughts, more deadly heat waves, more extinct species, more poisons in our air and in our water. In fact, one of the most important lessons we can learn from today's planetary crisis is one that Friedrich Engels taught us a long time ago when he said, let us not flatter ourselves over much on account of our human conquest over nature, for each such conquest takes its revenge on us. And that, in many ways, defines what the Anthropocene is about. So the Anthropocene is not a buzzword. A trend, well, it, unfortunately, it's used that way, but it shouldn't be. It's not the time of human influence, and it's not the time of human control. It is the time when human activity is disrupting the entire Earth system in fundamental ways and setting it on unpredictable and dangerous trajectories into circumstances and conditions that we have no, imagine, no ability even to imagine yet because it's never happened before. This is new. A good starting point for any credible discussion of the subject would start with something like this, which is a paragraph from three of the leading authorities on the subject. The term Anthropocene suggests that the Earth has now left its natural ge geological epoch, the present interglacial state that's called the Holocene. Human activities have become so pervasive and profound that they rival the great forces of nature and are pushing the Earth into planetary terra incognita, and you see that phrase so many times in the scientific li literature, unknown territory. The Earth is rapidly moving into a, biolog a less biologically diverse, less forested, much warmer, and probably wetter and stormier state. Now that's a starting point, but it's an understatement. If the processes that are now driving global change continue, by the end of this century, substantial parts of the Earth will be too hot to live in. We are already having times. Last year, there was a period of about a week when areas of Iran had temperatures in the 50s Celsius. 
It's too hot, hot to work in that. It's too hot to be outside in that. But parts of the earth will be unlivable. Coastal areas on every continent and many island states will be flooded by rising oceans, and an ever-increasing number of animal and plant species will die out, leading to the, in the long term to a mass extinction comparable to the death of the dinosaurs, except we'll be the dinosaurs. In short, Anthropocene isn't just a word, it's a global emergency. Now to understand how it came about and what it means, we have to adopt what the American Marxist George Novak, who's one of the people I uh, dedicated the most recent book to, what George called the long view of history. If you restrict your vision to just a few decades or even just a few centuries, you won't appreciate the revolutionary significance of what scientists are calling the Anthropocene. This is a very rough version of the geological time scale. Geologists divide Earth's history, four and a half billion years of it, into a hierarchy of time intervals called the geological time scale. We live, can I make this work? Yes. In the Holocene epoch of the Quaternary period of the Cenozoic era. The Holocene is officially still the epoch we are in. It began 11,000 years ago, 11,700 years ago, when the last ice age ended. What is now being said, he said, there. What is now being said is that the Holocene has ended and a new epoch has begun. And this is a really big deal for geologists because divisions on the time scale are not arbitrary or loosely defined. Each of them reflects major changes in the dominant conditions and forms of life on Earth. The Cenozoic era is marked by the rise of mammals following the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. The Pleistocene epoch was marked by repeated expansions and contractions of continental ice sheets that we usually call the ice ages. The Pleistocene climate wasn't just colder than it is today in the Holocene, it was also much more chaotic. This, diet, this slide shows the average global temperature in the last 100,000 years of the Pleistocene. As you can see, it was anything but stable or consistent. But if you look up in the far right-hand corner, that's the, when the glaciers retreated and Holocene conditions began. And suddenly, relatively suddenly, as geologists measure these things, we had a period of warmer, and not just warmer, but more stable climatic conditions. That's the period in which we live, and in which our species has lived a great part of its life. Modern humans evolved about 165,000 years ago, so we were mostly living in this chaotic part. But for 95% of the time, our species lived as hunter-gatherers, a nomadic uh, life in small groups. There's evidence that some of them experimented with cultivating wild plants, but the experiments were short-lived, not because they weren't smart enough to be farmers, but because the climate kept changing so rapidly, you couldn't make a permanent way of life out of farming. Only the warmer and climatically stable conditions that began about 12,000 years ago permitted agriculture, permanent settlements, and complex civilizations to develop and thrive. In the first few thousand years of the Holocene, after 165,000 years of not doing it, permanent agriculture developed, permanent settlements, and complex civilizations emerged. In fact, just to show it wasn't an accident, after the Holocene began, agriculture was invented independently in at least 11 different parts of the world radical shift of conditions that people could live under. And that led, of course, to the great civilizations of the past 6,000 years. Holocene conditions, it's often said, are the only global environment that we are sure is a safe operating space for the complex, extensive civilizations that Homo sapiens has constructed. In the late 1980s, Scientific concerns about global change 
led to the launch of the largest and most complex inter scientific, international scientific cooperation product, pro I'll start that one again, led to the launch of the largest and most complex program of international scientific cooperation and study ever undertaken. It was called the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And for between 1990 and 2015, just two years ago, the IGBP coordinated the efforts of thousands and thousands of scientists around the world to study what is going on with our planet. And that meant figuring out what was going on in the past in order so that we could see if it's changed or do we have examples of this to compare it with. In 2004, that led to a synthesis report bringing together the work of those thousands of scientists, a book called Global Change in the Earth System. It's still the best account available of the science of the Anthropocene. Now, it's out of print, but if you go to the IGBP website, it's there as a free PDF and well worth reading. They've promised it will stay up there for 25 years because their program has now been folded into other things. That report summarized the results of 10 years of research into the Earth system in these words. They said, quote, the planet is now dominated by human activities. Human changes to the Earth system are multiple, complex, interacting, and often exponential in rate and globally significant in magnitude. They affect every Earth system component, land, coastal zone, atmosphere, and oceans. The magnitude, spatial scale, and pace of human-induced change are unprecedented. Today, humankind has begun to match or even, and even exceed some of the great forces of nature in changing the biosphere and impacting other facets of Earth system functioning. Human-driven changes are pushing the Earth system well outside of its normal operating range. There is no evidence that the Earth system has previously experienced these types, scales, and rates of change. The Earth system is now in a no-analog situation best referred to as a new era in the geological history of the Earth, the Anthropocene. The best known and most dangerous disruption of the Earth system affects the global carbon um, cycle. Scientists have known since late 1800s that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere controls the planet's temperature. But it wasn't until the 1990s, in fact, late in the 1990s, that research showed how very tightly the greenhouse effect is linked to climate and how finely tuned it is. Gases trapped in ancient snow, extracted from deep in Antarctica, prove that for hundreds of thousands of years, the carbon cycle has kept atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide within remarkably well-defined limits. During the Pleistocene, remember the chaotic temperature we saw there? In that period, carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere were never lower than 160 million parts per million in cold time and never higher than 300 parts per million in the warmest times. During the Holocene, our last 12,000 years, the time when human societies developed as they have, the range has been even closer. It's been never lower than 260 and never higher than 280 for 12,000 years. This graph shows atmospheric CO2 levels over the past 800,000 years. We are now about 409. And uh, it's actually popped over 410 a couple of times, but we're pretty consistently over 409 this month. Um, it's higher now than it has been in any time in the fast, past 5 million years. Wallace Broker, who's been called the grandfather of climate history, likes to say that uh, the Earth's climate system is an ornery beast which overreacts to even small nudges. Well, what we're doing is not giving the climate small nudges. We're poking it with a sharp stick. And nobody should be surprised if the Earth system 
fights back, overreacts to the changes. And nobody should be surprised if the result is a world unlike anything humanity has ever seen. We say five million years. We're talking well before our species. Last year, the average global temperature passed one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level. You know, some of these m numbers might seem small, but you should know that during the coldest parts of the ice age, ice ages, the average temperature of the world was only five degrees less than it is now. So very small temperatures, remember you're talking about over a whole globe, can make a big impact. It's now approaching 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial, which has generally been viewed as the boundary between dangerous change and extremely dangerous change. The Earth has not been this hot since before the Ice Ages, and the temperature is continuing to rise faster than any forecast or climate model has predicted. The result isn't just warmer weather, but more extreme and changeable weather, raising the possibility of a return to chaotic conditions, like the Pleistocene, but hot instead of cold. That shift and many others like it, and I'm only talking about one cycle, one issue here, the carbon cycle, there's many more. That shift and many others led the Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Crutzen to declare in February of 2000 that the Holocene is over and that the Earth system today is as different from the Holocene as the Holocene was from the Ice Ages. He proposed to call the new epoch Anthropocene from the Greek word anthropos, which means human being. And that name has stuck. Uh, probably not the best name ever invented, but it's the one they got. Um, contrary to what a lot of critics have charged, he didn't use that word to say all humans are responsible for it. In fact, Crutzen explicitly said in his first statement on this that the effects were caused by a minority of Earth's population. Now, he's no Marxist. He didn't come down to the 1% did it. But he very clearly said that this was not caused by most people. He said the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene now is, exists now because of changes that wouldn't have occurred if humans didn't exist, which is quite different from saying all humans bear equally responsib equal responsibility for it. Now, Crutzen initially suggested that the new epoch may have begun with the Industrial Revolution, um, when large-scale burning of coal uh, first launched a long-term rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide. And that was a very important insight, and that was worked with by scientists for some time after Crutzen's initial paper. But when they, they were working on that uh, synthesis book that I told you about, they decided to do some detailed studies of how other things had changed and how all the different factors of, in the Earth system have changed uh, since the Industrial Revolution, which is when they were assuming this, the big deals, big changes began. When they did that, they discovered a surprising pattern. These are just some of their graphs. They show Earth system trends from 1750 to 2010 in this particular case. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, methane and nitrous oxide levels, ocean acidification, depletion of fish stock, species extinctions, forest loss, and so on. And what's interesting is that virtually every one of those trend lines, and there's many more, shows this kind of pattern. A long and relatively slow growth beginning around 1750 in the Industrial Revolution, followed by exponential growth, also almost asymptotic growth, beginning about 1950. So what we see is a sudden shift that brings us to the present. That period since 1950, it came to be known as the Great Acceleration. As the authors of the IGPP synthesis report said, the last 50 years have without doubt seen the most rapid transformation of the human relationship with the natural world in the history of our species. In the most recent upgrade to their graphs, 
they concluded that nine of the 12 indicators I just showed you have, quote, clear, nine out of 12 indicators have clearly moved beyond the bounds of Holocene variability. That is, during the Holocene, those all went up and down a little bit, but now, since 1950, nine out of 12 of them have moved outside the range of variability that we had for 11, 12,000 years. That's why the, the Anthropocene Working Group, by a 34 to 1 vote, concluded that the beginning of the Anthropocene should be set at the, in the middle of the 20th century. Words like unprecedented, terra incognita, and no analog state are used frequently to describe the current state of the Earth. No previous period in the Holocene shows comparable changes to these. We are now facing, by any standard, any reasonable measure, a planetary emergency. The United States Development Program warns that by the end of this century, the specter of catastrophic ecological impacts could have moved from the bounds of the possible to the probable. The noted climate scientist James Hansen says, planet Earth creation, the world in which civilization developed, the world with climate patterns we know and stable shorelines is in imminent peril. Socialists cannot possibly ignore a crisis of this magnitude. You know, there's a famous line in Marx, a if you're a Marxist, you've probably quoted it, where Marx says that humanity makes its own history, but not under conditions of its own choosing. This is a remarkable example of that, one Marx couldn't possibly have predicted. But we now face the, the challenge, as socialists, of changing the world in the context of impending environmental disaster on a global scale. That's the reality of our time. The way we build socialism, and in fact the kind of socialism we're going to be able to build, will be fundamentally shaped by the state of the planet that we are trying to build it on. The longer it takes to get the necessary changes underway, the more difficult that transformation is going to be. As the Brazilian socialist and atmospheric scientist Alexander Costa writes, the fight to avoid a catastrophic outcome to this crisis engendered by capitalism is the fight to safeguard the material conditions for survival with dignity of humankind. Socialism is not possible on a scorched earth. Those great acceleration graphs, the hockey stick pattern, now heading nearly straight up in every case, display, display critical impacts of capitalism spreading across the world, our world, to satisfy its appetite for accumulation, burning ever larger quantities of fossil fuels to do that. And every day capitalism's relentless drives accelerate, the trend lines continue to rise, and the crisis becomes more severe. If business as usual continues, the first full century of the Anthropocene will be marked by a rapid deterioration of our physical, social, and economic environment. The decay of the biosphere will be most notable as global warming and extreme weather. But we can also expect rising ocean levels, leading to widespread flooding of islands and coastal cities, the collapse of major fisheries, something we are already seeing, um, poisoned rivers, and much more. Every global cycle, I've talked about carbon, but the nitrogen cycle is affected, the phosphorus cycle is affected. All of the cycles that have made life possible on this planet are being disrupted in unpredictable ways. You can suppose there's this tiny little fraction of a possibility, maybe it'll be good for us. The chances are really, really low. And if that happens, if, for example, we get a convergence of multiple Earth system failures, the Anthropocene may be the shortest of all epochs as we move into something much worse. The only way to avoid that is with methods that are anathema to capitalism. 
Profit has to be removed from consideration. Changes have to be made as part of a democratically created and legally binding global plan because we can't deal with this except globally. A plan that governs both the conversion to renewable energy and the rapid elimination of major industries and activities such as arms production, advertising, and factory farming. All of those things that only produce what the 19th century artist John Ruskin described as ilf, the opposite of wealth. There are no guarantees on this. Um, an eco-socialist revolution, the kind I try to work for, is not inevitable. It'll only happen if people consciously decide that it's necessary. As Marx and Engels said in the Communist Manifesto, the class struggle will lead either to a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or to, quote, the common ruin of the contending classes. In the Anthropocene, the common ruin of all, the destruction of civilization, is a very real possibility. In a passage that should be much more widely known and promoted, Karl Marx wrote that what we have is a duty to future generations. This is a long-term process we are talking about. And he said even an entire society, a nation, or all simultaneously existing societies taken together are not the owners of the earth. They are simply its possessors, its beneficiaries, and they have to bequeath it in an improved state to succeeding generations. In my new book, there's a chapter called Eco-Socialism, a Society of Good Ancestors. To have a society whose focus is to think in terms of what comes beyond us. I keep that quote posted next to my computer, next to this picture. That's Abby and Sam, my grandchildren helps me remember what the point of all this is. The Holocene is over, and the Anthropocene has begun. That cannot be reversed now. But what we can do, and what we do do in the next few decades, will determine what the Anthropocene will be like, and what kind of planet Abby and Sam will grow up on. On the other side of my grandkids' picture, I have posted Antonio Gramsci's aphorism, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Because in my view, it defines an eco-socialist attitude towards the Anthropocene. We know that disaster is possible, but we refuse to surrender to despair. If we fight, we may lose. If we don't fight, we will lose. And our grandchildren will pay the price. Good luck or bad luck may play a role, but a conscious and collective struggle to stop capitalism's hellbound train is our only hope for a better world. As Gramsci also said, it is necessary with bold spirit and in good conscience to save civilization. We must halt the dissolution which corrodes and corrupts the roots of human society. The bare and barren tree can be made green again. And he said, are we not ready? And what I say, and I hope you agree, is that our answer to Gramsci's question is and must be, yes, we're ready. Thank you. So while we're waiting for them, the first question in is, uh, to what extent can individual, meso, or country level action stop the onset of mass extinction? I pass them over. Okay, sir. Oh, sorry. Is it the red one? Yes? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I want to talk about the oceans uh, and fisheries and 
in the process that Ian has been describing since the Second World War, which is not a cheerful subject, but because there has been a massive loss of diversity um, and this process has sped up in the last 40 years of uh, roughly the period of neoliberalism. And this is actually threatening life in the oceans and bearing in mind that every single person on Earth relies on the oceans. So uh, to sum it up very quickly, the World Wildlife Fund did a report in 2015 called uh, the Living Blue Planet Report in which they described the loss of diversity of marine um, vertebrates so um, that had declined over the last 40 years by, about, by on average, 49%. So thinking about cod and salmon and haddock, the things we're really familiar with. And then they described sharks, rays and skates, of which uh, 25% are threatened with extinction due to overfishing and environmental degradation. And then there are the specific species like the um, mackerel, bonito and tuna that have declined by 74%. Then at the same time, we've had the process of, as water is warming, it's absorbing more carbon dioxide. And this means that um, corals, crabs, lobsters, and shellfish can't make their calcium carbonate shells as easily as they used to do, which means that fewer of them will survive. And you have to remember that corals form a quarter of the, sorry, they form the nurseries for a quarter of the world's fish. And this entire process has been driven by the privatization of the oceans. Fisheries have been privatized and they are being stripped for profit. There is no um, coincidence here that this entire process is being driven by capitalism, um, it's being driven by profit, and we also have to insist at the same time that ordinary fishers and their communities are not to blame for this. We have to look to the corporations and the trawler owners. And this explains why there is such an enormous level of forced labor, unpaid wages, and violence in the fisheries industries worldwide. I mean, for instance, the work of Christine Stringer in New Zealand, where she discovered that actually most boats um, fishing under... Um, large boats, obviously trawlers, fishing under New Zealand flags, um, where actually it's other corporations that's been outsourced. Um, they, they had extremely high levels of forced labour, so that's slavery. You know, people have no choice to leave. Um, unpaid wages and violence, including sexual assault and murder. Can you wind up now? Come and on. so, okay, we have to look at um, the solutions to this. And you just have to think that, yeah, it's true. We will need to not fish certain species for, I mean, perhaps a decade, perhaps longer. But what we could do is redeploy and employ um, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people around the world building offshore wa um, wind farms, um, offshore wave projects. Now, yeah. And um, that's the way we could create um, a process where we could, um, we can fight for a just future. Thank you. Sorry, I did forget to say, I'm going to keep the contributions to three minutes just to try and get more people in. So when I tap the microphone, that's two minutes. Um, so you've got a minute left. So after Harkan from York uh, will be Dave Sewell from Socialist Worker. And I'm just going to read out another question, if that's all right. Um, which is from uh, Valerie from Toronto. Can you please describe the LEAP Manifesto? Do you think it can present an effective way to face the Anthropocene? Hi, I'm Harkan from York, Manchester UP. It's just a question for the speaker, really, as to how reversible is and will be the Anthropocene in the next few, he few years, so five, ten years, even a hundred years, two hundred years, like, and what, what will the human race need to do to counteract the effects and even cope with it if it's not reversible. I think it was a pretty amazing talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, after Dave will be um, Arthur Nicholl from Dundee. Can I just read out another question, Dave? Is that all right? 
good to get me at the beginning. Okay, can you put Trump's recent pullout from the Paris talks in the context of the Anthropocene? What are the real implications of this in terms of accelerating climate change? It shows that some of us have not left the place to see. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, this is all really, really terrifying reality to, to, to grapple with. We have to grapple it. And one of the main sort of priorities and urgencies to come out of any look at climate change is we absolutely need to address the destruction of the environment and in particular uh, carbon emissions and, and the system that creates them. But I think this throws up something else as well, which is that if we have now broached all these boundaries of the Holocene, and that this era that is the only safe operating uh, condition that we know of for human civilization is over. And even if the revolution was tomorrow and we stopped carbon emissions, the Earth system is this ornery beast that overreacts, and we're going to be in, in, in this mess. And I think we're looking at a situation where the survival of human civilization into the next couple of centuries is in doubt. Um, and... You know, I think it's down to, to socialism, really, to provide an answer to that, to provide an answer to how we can survive. And, you know, I think it's possible. I think there's all kinds of things where you look at how the capitalist system works. It's incompatible with and an obstacle to that survival. I mean, I was um, doing a meeting on, 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 on border controls. I think to survive the Anthropocene, in reality, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, probably billions, will have to move to be somewhere else. And the border system we have is an obstacle to that. I think all the patterns of consumption that, that we have are this absurd attempt by a market economy to have social production but the pretense of individual production and, and, and that creates vast inefficiencies we need to overcome but I think that is a question that's on the agenda now for all of humanity that only we can answer I think what, what, what Ian said is really really valuable bringing this to attention but there is one sort of nitpicking bit I, I didn't really like the, the, the quotation there can be no socialism on a scorched planet I think the question for any political tradition now is how do we survive a scorched planet? If socialism is to mean anything at all, it's offering that path to survival. Thank you. So can I just read out one question? Thanks. Uh, which is, if you are serious, why did you fly here and not Skype? <laughs> Okay, thanks. Sir. I just want um, the, there was a there was a point that came up in uh, Martin's meeting the other day about about um, about the whole question. I mean, part of the, the issue here is the whole question about sustainability and about about how we how we shift production and shift the development in the world onto an agenda that says that we can sustain. You know, the the the, the net consequence of that is, is is a situation where we have resources that can continue and that can be replenished and we can move on. And that's about renewables and that's about changing the whole way industry works for the better for, for, for human beings and not for profit. Profit. And it's that whole question about the constant pursuit by capitalism for not just profit. And I always refer to people the, 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 the question about um, the film, the, the crappy comedy with, with Danny DeVito called Other People's Money, where you got this old kind of company that was family run that made a profit, but he comes in and basically he's just an asset stripper and he wants to rip out. But the point is, we're kind of in an era now where capitalism's all about this remote control. Um, uh, running of everything for profit and it's the pursuit of that rate of profit regardless of whether a company is successful or not the pursuit of the rate of profit at any given day means everything is disposable everything and sustainability goes out the window now part of the thing, question you asked then is about who's, who is making that investment and part of the investment, the question is, is things like big pension funds, now a lot of us, I work in the public sector, we've got pension funds that are running our interests as employees and because of certain changes in legislation, we now have a bit of a say in how those pension funds are run. Now, we run up against constantly this argument about fiduciary duty from our, from our, from our, from our officers that run the pension funds, trying to say, well, you can't, you can't really do anything unless you make sure that you're, you're getting the best return. Now, I think we have to be fighting a battle by, by promoting within our, within, our, within our membership, within these public sector places, particularly we've got these big pension funds, and promoting a campaign to get support for, to back our union, union representatives in these funds and in the, on these committees, on these boards, to make sure that we're pushing the agenda that we want our children, part of the benefit for us as, as people who have that pension scheme, is we want a future for us and a future for our kids. So we need to build that, 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 that momentum and make sure we can get these investment funds and force these bloody pension managers to actually offer uh, investment that's actually sustain, built on sustainability and built on renewables and built on a future for our, for, for, for our species and for our planet. Thank you.
So after Esme, uh, I want to call Judy Pascal. Can I just read out a question, Esme? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Isn't the rise of the car a huge part of the danger, and don't we need to stop using them now? Um, Ian talked quite rightly, in my view, about a planetary emergency, and I think really drove home how serious the crisis that we face is. You can't think of a more serious crisis than the fact that the potential all basis of life on Earth is under current threat. The thing that really frustrates me is that we've known this process is underway for many, many years. I remember being at school and doing projects about global warming. It isn't that people haven't known these things. People have known these things for a very long time. The problem is that under the economic system that we live under, there isn't the ability to actually correct these things, to stop these things in their tracks and to change them. You see, I think one of the questions that's thrown up by Ian's talk and by the whole discussion that's emerged around the Anthropocene, that's the English pronunciation, um, is that about humans' relationship to nature and the interaction between humans and nature because precisely because the crisis is so great, I think it leads to a tendency for some in the movement, quite understandably, to feel that the only relationship that humans can be, have with nature is one of being destructive, that the real problems that we face are that there are too many people or too much technology or that humans, can only, humans have to be tamed, if you like, because we can only be destructive. Whereas in actual fact, it's not, as Ian himself pointed out, it's not every people who are doing this. It's the relations of capital that are doing this. Because if you think about it, every area is affected by the relations of capital. You think about what technologies get produced, which fuels get used, what transport systems are instituted. Or you think about actually... One of the illustrations that I think is quite helpful to think about, what we're not, what we're not talking about humans versus nature. We're talking about a system that actually destroys humans and nature. You think about something like world food production. World food production, because it's run for profit, involves the creation of monocultures, the reduction of biodiversity, the creation of GM seeds that will only um, work for one year and then will die. It creates food gluts in parts of the world and food shortages and chaos and hikes in food prices. Neither does it sustainably feed people, nor does it sustainably create a living environment for other creatures on the planet. So it's not humans versus nature, it's capitalism versus both of them. And that's why I think we have to say we have an interdependency between human beings and nature that could be very different if the economic system was different. And already there are many people in small projects and in different ways around the world trying to work on ways of making sustainable farming and agriculture and technology possible. The problem is they haven't got a shoe in and a world that is dominated by big business and global capitalism. But that's for me why this is such an urgent battle and a battle where we have to say only a world that is planned for need and not for destruction of, and not for, not for profit is the only sort of world where we could start to see a sustainable way where humans can live sustainably uh, and, and, um, and save the planet rather than destroy it. Thank you. Okay, um, Ian said, are we ready? And of course the answer, as he says, has to be... Can you not hear me? The answer has to be yes. And then the question is, what specifically do we as socialists do in Britain right now? And I think, without much doubt, the front line for us on climate is fracking at the moment. Um, and specifically fracking which is very nearly about to happen at Preston New Road near Blackpool in Lancashire. Um, fracking, as you probably all know, um, is a very extreme form of fossil fuel extraction. You probably also know, um, as the comrade mentioned who talked about the need for divestment of pension funds and so on, that we have to get out of all fossil fuels, we have to leave 80% of them at least in the ground. So the last thing we need is to have a new and particularly polluting form of fossil fuel developed. And of course it's all about profit. It's all about, and of course coming from the desolate, desolate north as some Tory called it, I feel very sore about this. You know, it's all about contempt for ordinary people like shown at Grenfell Tower contempt for people who live in Lancashire and anywhere else that they're hoping to do fracking. They don't care that we're going to live in a, in a gas field with polluted water, polluted air, ruined countryside. 
And that's what fracking's about, and that's before you even remember that fracking is a fossil fuel, and we cannot allow it to happen. It's going in exactly the wrong direction. We could be having, as somebody already mentioned, in terms of alternative employment for fishermen, we could be having a lot more wind turbines off the coast, very close to Blackpool, um, and there, there would be a lot more jobs in there than there will be in the fracking, which is about to happen. So we can't let it happen, and I want to appeal to people, um, particularly those who live in the northwest and other parts of the desert north, um, to come to, uh, to the site near Blackpool at any time that you can. This is the crucial time. They are already bringing in crucial equipment. It hasn't all yet come. People are going there every day, local people, people who've come from all over the country and, and camping, very dedicated people. But I think part of our view as socialists is that it's not down to a few dedicated people. It's numbers that make the difference. We must all be active. We must all get there. And can I appeal to you in particular to come this Friday when we're going to have a day which is kind of themed around climate jobs, uh, community renewable energy and divestment and uh, the idea will be to talk about those themes but above all to be there in numbers and to shut down that company's operations and to shut down any movements of equipment at least for that day and to help to persuade them that if it's profit thereafter we're going to stop them making any profit. Thank, Thank you. you. Bethan? I just want to talk a little bit about, I think, one of the reasons why I think it's important that as, you know, socialists, we do actually get involved in sort of these discussions around um, climate change. Because I recently um, read this book. Um, it wasn't Ian's. I hope Ian's is better than this one was, to be honest. Um, but um, basically, they did this thing that I think quite a like, lot of things sort of written about the environment do, where they quite correctly started off by saying how the situation, how dire the situation was, but then didn't really kind of offer any solutions to what we sort of do about it. And it is a little bit frustrating being told that we're all going to die, but we're not really sure what we're going to do about it, to be honest. Um, and there was this kind of, um, there was this kind of dismissal as well of kind of socialism and, and Marxism, which sort of went something along the lines of, well, the Soviet Union was supposedly socialist and that was quite bad for the environment. And you're there sort of going, yeah, except it wasn't really socialist, was it? But anyway. Um, and then... And the main frustra- but the main frustration really was that um, you sort of re- the, the authors they correctly identified um, you know sort of a lot of things that about that come about as a result of capitalism, so like war and sort of consumerism and the way we consume energy and so on, as being sort of the biggest factors and the biggest things responsible. But then they didn't um, link actually any of this back to capitalism. It was just kind of things like war presented as you know just this kind of aberration that kind of happens, as opposed to sort of being a result. Of, Im- of imperialism and as well I mean I don't know how many people have read Naomi Klein's book um, This Changes Everything it's really good I mean people who haven't read it should but again there was this thing of although she's quite correct in saying that neoliberalism and sort of free market capitalism is a big part of the problem again when it comes to the question of what she and she, she's correct and she says we need to have a society that's geared to much you know living where we don't actually worry about profit and we live in a much more sustainable way but again in terms of how we get there it's all a bit hand, hand wavy to be honest um, so I just think that's important. You know, we have stuff to say about all of you know these things about why, about you know wh- you know why like wars happen, wars happen, but why we consume in the way we do, about actually how we get that different kind of society. So I think it's just a, and you know there's a huge audience out there for that. So we need to be involved in ourselves um, in this kind of stuff. Anyway, I'll up. Oh, thank you, Ian. You're summing up. Thank you. Whoa, I got eight minutes to cover about forty hours of material. Um, So I'm not really going to answer all of the questions, obviously. Several of them address the question of individual activity and how what we can do as individuals. We can do as much, we can do a lot as individuals. We certainly can try to live as lightly, walk as lightly on the earth as we can. We can certainly, even more importantly, as individuals join with other individuals to try and change this world and try and change individual things about it. One of the sadder things that I note on the left as I've worked in this field is the tendency of people, at least some people on the left, to say, well, the solution is socialism, so anything less than that is not worth working for. And uh, see that again and again. How can you be in favor of X? It won't solve the problem. Um, To which my response very simply is, if you can't stop fracking in Lancashire, if you can't stop... um, 
a pipeline that's about to go through my hometown if we don't stop it, or if you don't, can't stop tar sands mining or anything like that, what the hell makes you think you can overthrow capitalism? <laughs> it's the... Our movements are built on, and movements will be built by fights big and small. And the most important thing I think we can do as individuals is take part in those fights so that they become collective activities. Now, I'm going to specifically mention flying and Skype because I do get asked that. And I, sc I do Skype to speak to conferences, and there are, there are variations. If the, my sole purpose in an event or the sole thing that the organizers want from me um, is to stand up and give a talk and go away, well, Skype is the way to do it. But if I want, and other people want, to collaborate, to discuss, to meet, to learn about other, the, the people we're going to have to work with uh, internationally, there really isn't an alternative to getting together. It's really important. Since I've been here, I've been talking not just to people from all over Britain uh, and Ireland, but from Turkey and Germany and Argentina. And those are experiences I certainly couldn't have had by, by Skype. So I think, I wish there were a, a, a less polluting way to do it than the way I got here, but walking from Ottawa isn't a great choice. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Um, Somebody mentioned the LEAP Manifesto. Since I'm from Canada, I presumed I'm an expert. Uh, the LEAP Manifesto, for those of you who have not heard of it, was developed by uh, uh, Naomi Klein and her partner, Avi Lewis, as a, a way of bringing together disparate forces to fight for social improvement cl against climate change and so on. And what's really intriguing about the LEAP Manifesto is that it wasn't just the product of those two people, but, they, but they, it's brought together environmentalists, indigenous activists who played a really big role in the climate movement in Canada, the labor movement, um, people from many parts of social movements. It's being heavily debated inside the New Democratic Party, which is roughly our equivalent of the Labour Party without Corbyn. Um, but um, it's an important step forward. It is not a revolutionary document, but it's an example of how you can bring different forces together to fight for these things. And uh, I, I do encourage you to take a look at it. Not that it particularly could be transferred into another country, but rather that it shows the kind of thing you can do collaboratively. And it's if only because it shows those forces have come together in Canada to try and make a change in the Canadian political dialogue and context is very important. Um, there's a whole lot. Oh, can we reverse the Anthropocene? That's a big question. No. Um, some of the changes that have happened are not reversible. We're not getting all those glaciers back. And that's a huge issue for our whole global climate, also for the ability of people in many countries, Bolivia, for example, simply to drink. Um, the glaciers um, and a good part of the, uh, the Arctic, uh, certainly the Arctic ice cap and a substantial part of Antarctica are gone. I mean, that's tragic, but true. Um, in, within anything like a, a time frame that we could count as human. Um, it's possible that in a thousand years, we will have, the world will have shifted enough, but that's not part of a political horizon for anybody reasonable. What we can do is reverse as much as we can. That is, we can slow the process, we can fight hard against fossil fuels, which are critical to this, and against factory farming, and against fracking, and all the other things. In order, basically, as, as Walter Benjamin says somewhere, you know, a revolution may not be the train, you know, we always think of it as the train to revolution. He says it might be the passenger slamming on the emergency brake. And uh, some of our revolution will be like that. I want to finish just, uh, rather than try and go through all this, this is a great discussion. It should continue. But I left out of my talk because I was running over. The other thing that I have up next to my picture of my grandkids, when I was writing the book, um, I came across this poem. His po there's a poet named, his name is Drew Dellinger, and he's a wonderful American poet. And I wrote to him and said, could I quote the central, the, the middle verse from a poem he wrote, which is called Hieroglyphic Stair Stairway. And I will finish it, this session, with reading his poem. As I say, next to my picture of my grandchildren. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake. Now, I should pause and say, what happened there was I wrote him, and he wrote back and said, yes, publish it. I really agree with your project, which made me excited. He said, it's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. 
My great-great-grandchildren ask me in my dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started falling, started failing, as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying. Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? Thank you.